meeting is being recorded. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our session, um, uh, 21st Century Assessments in Higher Education. And this afternoon's event is gonna be a panel discussion. We have uh, a battery of specialists in the field um, who, who will provide some insight and guide us and provide us some, with, with some tips in navigating through this new landscape of, um, of, of, of teaching and learning and educational assessments. Um, I'm your moderator for this afternoon's proceedings, Dr. Justin Zephyrin, and, um, and ha we're happy that you are here, that you've joined us. Um, this basically um, launches or commences the what we call our faculty um, professional development or teaching and learning week. And um, we have a whole schedule of events throughout this entire week. All right, so we're happy you're here and we look forward to seeing you um, in some of the other sessions that we have uh, later on in this week. And we will go through that schedule before the end of this afternoon's proceedings. All right. Um, so without further ado, I really want to, 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 to elaborate on this theme, our 21st century assessments in higher education. And why did we select this, this, this theme? All right. Now, this year's theme, assessments in higher education, is really targeted at addressing the challenges that have been encountered by both faculty and students regarding assessments in the current landscape of education, including the transition from remote to face-to-face -to -face assessments, online and alternative assessments, and so on. Now, the, the, in our previous um, uh, iterations of, of course evaluations and so on, student feedback and so on, we saw that some of the data indicated that assessments seem to be a pain point. Um, across the campus, across the university, I would say. And um, we, that was also, <laughs> we, we saw additional red flags um, based on faculty feedback because we had students who were um, twin indicators or indications of um, stress and anxiety and feeling overwhelmed. And so it seemed that the transition from remote assessments to face-to-face -face assessments or back to face-to-face -face assessments has been a rough experience for both faculty and students, yeah? So this is one in several um, avenues that we've taken to really address that situation and sort of mitigate some of those challenges, all right? And we know that assessments in this current uh, uh, landscape is, is not, it's different. Um, we no longer can rely entirely on traditional forms of assessments. All right, we, we have expanded to whether it's alternative or authentic assessment um, and that sort of thing. So the panel uh, this afternoon will really provide some insight um, in this regard. All right, and first on the panel, we have our very own Dr. Leroy Hill. Now, Dr. Hill is the director of the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. <clears throat> Dr. Hill holds a PhD in education, specifically in e-learning, from the University of Nottingham. His academic qualifications also include a master's in instructional design and technology from Virginia Technology, a postgraduate teaching certificate from the UWI, and a certificate in university and college administration from the University of Manitoba. Dr. Hill has taught online in the fields of teacher education, instructional design, learning design, um, and educational leadership. His research interests include sociocultural activity theory, distance and online education, learning designs, and teacher education. Dr. Hill is also the host of a podcast called Let's Talk E-Learning. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Dr. Hill. All right, you could put your, your round of applause in the chat. That'll be very much appreciated. <laughs> All right. Our next panelist is Professor Jerome Delisle. Professor Jerome Delisle is um, a program coordinator specifically in the field of educational leadership um, at the School of Education, the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. Now, Professor Delisle, um, in 1994, Professor Delisle was the first candidate to be awarded his doctorate at the School of Education. Back then it was called the Faculty of Education. Professor Delisle has worked continuously in the Division of Educational Research and Evaluation in the Trinidad and Tobago's Ministry of Education since 2003, on the methodology and reporting of national learning assessments. 
So he has some you know, experience in the public sector in the different levels of, of uh, education as well. Um, Professor Delisle is responsible for installing the current system of performance standards for national tests and the, and the 2010 CAP evaluation. He has also worked with the Accreditation Council of Trinidad and Tobago, ACTT, as a featured speaker in conferences and is a regular evaluator in registration and accreditation processes. He is a member of several learn, learning societies, including the American Educational Association, the National Council Measurement of, in Education, the International Association of Computerized Testing, and so many more. His current research interests include high stakes testing, formative assessment, standard testing, sorry, standard setting, and whole system change. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Jerome Delisle. All right, I'm seeing the round of applause in the chat, all right, from... <laughs> and um, let me just take this time to say that we also have uh, the, the, the battery of CTL staff here, the team, um, our producers, <laughs> Mr. Mark Garcia, and Mr. Javed Mohammed, as well as uh, we have uh, with us this afternoon, Dr. Julia Jones, our new faculty development specialist, as well as Mr. Randy Duku. All right, so back to the panelists. Dr. Mervyn Chisholm. Dr. Chisholm is the manager or coordinator of the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning, the CTL, at the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus. He is a specialist in curriculum reform and development and provides oversight to the curriculum development efforts on the campus. In his faculty development activities, he focuses on various areas of critical and emancipatory approaches to Caribbean university teaching. He also teaches adult and higher education in the School of Education at the Mona campus. His research interests include curriculum studies, teaching and learning in adult and higher education, postmodern, transformative, and critical approaches to education and university teaching. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Mervyn Chisholm. And not to be outdone, we have <laughs> Dr. William Shakespeare. All right, Dr. William Shakespeare is a lecturer in education at the University of Technology, Jamaica, where she also serves as the program leader for the postgraduate diploma in education. Moreover, she is a certified instructional designer and program evaluator. Dr. William Shakespeare has her PhD in curriculum and instruction, um, instructional technology from the University of South Florida, Tampa. Her research interests include distance learning and online learning, interactions in the online environment, online learning communities of practice, and women in doctoral studies. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the panel, Dr. Earldine Williams Shakespeare. All right, and that, um, so these are the four panelists we have this afternoon. Um, and we just, we welcome them. I see Norman's clapping in the, it's right, a round of applause. Um, <laughs> very nice, very nice. And so we 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 are happy to have um quite a, a battery of specialists with us this afternoon. As you can see from the from the from the the the, the introductions that they have quite a wealth of knowledge and um experience and um and very much equipped to give us some insight regarding 21st century assessments, all right, in higher education. So let's get straight into it. All right. Um, so we're going to ask some 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 key questions, and then we're going to um, feel some questions from from you. All right, our participants. Um, so feel free. You know, you could type when we get to that segment. You can always type it in the chat, and it will be featured, and um, our panelists will be happy to 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 answer. All right. So let's get straight into it because I want to spend as much time as possible to get um, to 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 to. to glean from, from their knowledge and expertise and that wisdom. All right, so let's get straight to it. So uh, with the recent pandemic and the transition to remote teaching and learning and assessments, the terms alternative and authentic assessments have been used almost synonymously. I'm sure many of you can agree, yeah? But there are substantive differences between the two. This question is really for Dr. Hill or Dr. Chisholm, I guess, CTL uh, uh, representatives with us. Um, can you explain the differences, um, explain alternative and uh, an authentic assessment? So that's one. And maybe perhaps Dr. Chisholm, you can um, highlight the differences between the two. Yeah. 
So yeah. perhaps, yeah, you go right ahead. I would, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that Dr. Hill will go first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if, if I may, Dr. Uh, um, Zephyrin, uh, make my first attempt at this mm -hmm. is perhaps try to delineate it that the begin by making sure that we understand the idea of alternative is often used to mean alternative to paper pencil, the traditional yes. forms of assessment. Uh, but in a very meaningful way, authentic assessment is a form, is an alternative form of an assessment uh, that, that requires us to take a deeper dive of alignment, um, the level of, of, of authenticity or practical mm -hmm when it deals with real world um, aspects. And we, I, I'm sure that we will unpack that a little bit more, yeah. but, but certainly from an authentic standpoint is how close you resemble the various context when it comes to the real world setting. Nice, nice. Yeah. That's, is that? mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. I'd, I'd like to agree with um, Dr. Hill on that. We do understand alternative assessment to be other forms of assessment that are not necessarily um, pen and pencil and that sort of thing and paper base. Mm -hmm. However, authentic assessment is about real life assessment, how people would operate in real work spaces, in right. the professional areas that they are going to. So the student is called on to pull from those areas and respond in those ways, uh, you know, demonstrating some element of professional tasks, right. how persons would address professional tasks in the workplace. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's always this, this situation where persons are arguing or querying whether or not it is authentic enough to be authentic, <laughs> you know, you know, that, that's a question that, is, that yes. comes to mind from time to time. Is it really authentic? Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things is all authentic tasks are alternative assessment. Right. But not everything that we call alternative assessment mm -hmm. can be named as authentic. Authentic has to do with the real world Mm -hmm. and the activities that occur in those real spaces. Right, right. So in other words, um, when you think of alternative assessments, it's sort of like that umbrella under which authentic assessment is a sort of, I don't want to call it a variant, but one form of alternative assessment, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So. This, I, I didn't have this written down, but this, I guess, is a branch um, off of what was just said. In terms of the assessments, let's say in a, in a course or a program overall, um, do you think that we should lean, we should choose more of one over the other, or should there be a balance, or should we just um, focus only on authentic kinds of assessments? Should we do away with pen and paper types of assessments, or do you think we should have a mix of the two? I don't know who's going to take this. But I'm going <laughs> to take, anyway. take a bite at it. Uh, <laughs> in that, I, I, I'm, I'm, I think when we when we teach in university, we we align ourselves uh, with standards, and some of those standards are competency based. Mm -hmm. Some of those standards are based within industry standards, and so in my in my thinking, if we are wedded towards not. Um, um, diversifying our assessment strategy to ensure that our students can transfer. And I think this is where authentic assessment finds greater relevance. And we saw that particularly during the, the COVID when we made that pivot um, and many persons did not know how to cope because they were thinking traditional paper pencil tests. Now I'll tell you this, uh, there's one theory that I subscribe to distance education theory that um, um, equivalency uh, theory, Simonson and his colleagues in, in pushing that, um, advanced the thinking that it necessarily has to be the same, but equal. And I think this is where we began exploring um, alternative ways, uh, but most of them 
um, I, I, according to what Dr. Chisholm was just saying, may not necessarily have been authentic. And right. I think this is where we want to perhaps give a balance. I think there's more, uh, there, there's been a greater um, commitment to doing mm -hmm. things differently because we recognize, number one, from the emotional standpoint, our students were just not inundated with so many things, they didn't know how to cope. Right. But in a very meaningful way, it really highlights certain gaps in how meaningful we are in making that, that, that industry, university to industry, less of a, uh, a boundary crossing, uh, kind of blurred the lines of boundary crossing for, for individuals. Nice. Thank yeah. you so much for that. Dr. Chisholm, I, I, I see you look yeah, like you have something to say. Yes, sir. I, I think also that it depends on the, the discipline and, and certainly mm. some of the courses within that, uh, that discipline, yeah. whether or not we have a balance or whether we're going to um, do away with um, traditional kinds of assessment tasks mm -hmm. in favor of more authentic tasks. For instance, in, in the medical area, um, we offer degrees in uh, medicine and right. certainly the lecturers in the, that area would want to tell us that the student in certainly the first and second year, the preclinical programs, right. they would want to ensure that they have a good cognitive base and, uh, and tra traditional assessments would definitely be one of the ways in which you want to test the, mm -hmm. the cognitive intake of a number of your students so that they can demonstrate that kind of learning in more practical ways in the more yeah. authentic tasks later on. So it serves as a good precursor to um, when they eventually transition to more hands-on authentic um, yeah. kind of assessment. Okay, good. So, so based, just, to find, just to build that knowledge or that foundation. Uh, Prof, uh, Delisle, Professor Delisle, I see you have your hand up. Go right ahead, sir. Yeah, now, I have a slightly different view of the term, so I don't want to be mm -hmm. contrary, because I, I, I belong to two communities, and they um, also see the words as, as, as different. That's the yes. measurement community and the assessment community. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure the word alternative always applies to British-based systems, because mm -hmm. we've always had practicals. So right. we've never had, we've never had as in the US, you know, um, uh, the paper and the pencil um, shading thing. We've never truly had that as a as a overwhelming approach uh, to assessment. However, mm -hmm. authenticity, I think, is extremely important. And when we were trying to change the assessment system in the medical faculties between 1998 um, to 2003, uh, 2003 was the installation of the new, um, the new scheme. Um, mm -hmm. we, we saw authenticity as a, a value characteristic of all assessments. Um, we realized that a practical assessment, a, a spotter, could be as inauthentic as you, you, you could <laughs> imagine. But we also realized that as far as your assessment, and, and, and that's a fantastic point that Dr. Ches Chesler mentioned, that as, as far as your uh, 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 multiple choice assessments were concerned, mm -hmm. you could make it more authentic um, by adding a vignette, we call it case-based right. clinical right. Um, scenarios, et cetera, which, mm -hmm. which, which of course that wonderful faculty then, they tried to, to push everything towards and, and and we were pretty successful in looking at, at, at that issue so i think that we should always look for authenticity mm -hmm. um and and just as uh doc, dr hill mentioned um you want to do it because you want an a a, a, a better transfer you don't want somebody right. learning something in an inauthentic situation mm -hmm. and 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 then they 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 on the job as a professional and still like What's that? I, I don't yes. understand. Yes. So, so I think authenticity. I, I I really value it, and and I class it as highly as in higher education, um, mm -hmm. as, as validity and reliability. Right. So let me let me see if I we just you know to 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 un, if I fully understand what you're saying. Are you saying that we can have um, authentic or authenticity even in traditional? types of assessments. So for example, the, the, the instance you gave where if it's a multiple choice exam, for example, you know, for instance, um, 
could it be a sort of case study based kind of thing? And would that be a form of um, authenticity or is it still considered traditional? Uh, it would have, there would be a measure of authenticity if you mm -hmm. were able to add a scenario that right. was real life. So, you know, but, I mean, in my days is a long time, but, um, you know, you, you had those sets of questions and then you had a diagram and mm -hmm. you watch it as if that diagram do, do occur in real life, but you could have right. made it authentic <laughs> if you had shown a true pulley and lever system that right. every building site has. So, right. so yeah, so, so that is actually a move. And, and, and I'm not going to go into the, the more detail or say anything more, mm -hmm. but I want to say in the uh, Common Core, mm -hmm. the, 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 the three or four companies that got the contract, including right. Smarter Balance, um, right. they tend to emphasize authenticity. So even some of the questions that they have in mass, um, they have large flow, flow plans, and you have to analyze that and they say, well, look, authentic, that's what children use math for. So yes, it's a trend. Nice. And, nice. and if, if I oh, may, yeah. Dr. Dr. Zephyrin also tag on here by saying that in the research, it has also been clear that what, what, uh, what, what Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Delisle is um, pushing here is that mm -hmm. the, the idea of the context within the, the, the authentic, you can mm -hmm. bring in the social context. You can right. bring in from a task that you need to do. You mm -hmm. can bring it from um, perhaps the criteria that's used mm -hmm. within the, the, the practical setting. So it's, yes. it's multiple. You can marry, you can marry and make it de de deepen the degree of authentic, authentic right. um, assessment in various ways. So it isn't, you know, you may not necessarily have the opportunity to bring, uh, bring them in the, in, the, in the real world setting, mm -hmm. um, uh, but you may simulate those things right. and they begin to I think that's a very important point because very often we think authentic um assessments mean they have to go out into the field and and mm -hmm. you know like you said simulate Dr. Hill so so I think um that's a very good point um that you can have um some form or, or avenue an avenue for authenticity um even within the parameters of a traditional ass assessment so I think that is uh I wish we knew that even <laughs> even during that remote uh, teaching and learning phase, all right? I see um, in the chat we have uh, Mrs. Michelle Stewart-McCoy representing the Mona campus, all right? And she said, exactly, Prof. And I know she's also supporting Dr. Chisholm and everyone here. Um, I see uh, we also have a, a question from Dr. Jones. In what ways could technology be used to... Oh, ooh, this is a nice one. In what ways could technology be used to augment authenticity in assessments? I'll leave that open to the entire panel. Anyone wants to take a shot at that? In what ways could technology be used to augment authenticity in assessments? Um, Chair, I, I, I just wanted to say before you, you get to that question, the old notion of performance assessment mm -hmm. must be also engaged in this conversation yeah. because a number of um, writers, researchers in this field would underscore the place of performance. Indeed, some writers suggest that if it is going to be authentic, it is performance-based. And that's a major mm -hmm. concern for some person. I think you just intimated that in your comments. Mm -hmm whether or not there is an orientation to um, authenticity or whether it is actual authenticity, we right. see all of these permutations in the <laughs> literature. In the yes. literature, you know, yes. one of the things about us in education is that we are never, we are not an exact science. Mm. So we allow room for some of these uh, understandings mm -hmm. to creep yes, in. Yes, there's a twist and a bend and a, yeah. To, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I, I think I, Dr. Hill might want to speak to the issue of um, uh, technology since he is the <laughs> well, I, I, I think, Dr. Chisholm, thank you. That the, the question, Dr. Jones, and thank you, Dr. Jones, raised the, I think, 
Dr. Justin, uh, just Dr. Zephyrin, we could actually highlight our, our, our alignment with the VR strategy mm -hmm. because we recognize that um, uh, in a very meaningful way, we can use the, the virtual reality platforms out there to simulate um, parts of the human body, um, right. you know, <laughs> mechanical engineering, all those different things. But I, I think from a, from on the whole back end, what technology affords us is the opportunity to really deepen our commitment to universal design, number one, mm -hmm. because we often see, we often see um, from a traditional sense of assessment as being endemic, being episodic, rather than being teaching assessment as learning. And so technology, uh, in a very meaningful way, allows us to make the, the, the timing or the, 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 the sort of dance between assessment and learning to be much more right. back and forth rather than being it very much, okay, you learn this and you, you know, it's a much more continuous. And we use the word formative, but it, it, it's, it's certainly recognizing that assessment as learning is an right. integral part of, of um, benefiting using technology. And mm -hmm. there is also the, the aspect of making it very um, personalized because right. we mm -hmm. recognize that uh, everybody that comes to a learning environment might come with different um, preferences in terms of how they want to access the, uh, the learning experience, in terms of where they are. Uh, and so, depending on where you are, technology, learning management systems now use the data, data, I mean, they use mm -hmm. learning analytics to really advance the learner through different paths. So you may not necessarily see learners going through uh, a system with uh, this sort of cookie cutter, um, um, they, they can actually go in, in what we call a, um, a, a multiple path, alternate paths right. towards yes. the towards yes. advancement. But we can we could I like some of that as we go through the, the panel. Yes. But it's, it's a very Definitely. it's a very uh, interesting question there. Yeah, um, I think um, uh, the, the, this question can be for both uh, Dr. Hill and and Dr. Shakespeare. Um, and I'm not uh, sure I think Dr. She can Shakespeare be, is back in. Yeah, she's she's back in. Um, but she just had to switch a device. So okay. I guess we can add her back to the, the panel there. Panel, okay. Um, but in the meantime, um, the I see we have a question here, uh, well, a, a sub-question of um, the, the chat GPT, right? <laughs> All right. Um, I don't know if Dr. Hill or Dr. William Shakespeare could shed some light on that in terms of um, how would assessment in the university level or at the university level change in light of AI, for example? And I know we did touch on that with augmented and virtual reality and making it um, sort of, making it um, more personalized, all right? But we do, I, I wanna hear your take, Dr. Hill or, or Dr. William Shakespeare on chat GPT, for example. Yeah. Th th thank you. And if I, if I may, I, I know we, we got out the immersive view, but um, in a very meaningful way, the, the idea for generative, um, uh, what we call artificial intelligence has been with us for a while. I mean, we've been using, some of us, of us have used um, Siri. <laughs> some of us have used, <laughs> um, uh, we've used um, I mean, every every day I use, um, gosh, um, what's her name? Alexa. Alexa. <laughs> Alexa, Alexa hears me. Alexa yes. is going to really get angry because I use Alexa every day. And, mm -hmm. and so those, those they're, they're not, they're not, it's chat GBT in itself is new because of the, the, the level of, um, ingenuity that the bot gives us. It's really, it's really a, 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 a chat bot that allows us to interact with um, that, that artificial intelligence interface. And so it's, it's those questions of in the back end that a lot of persons have that, that lies on ethics and the, and the morality of it, because right. obviously the technology does not necessarily understand the deep the right from wrong and sometimes some of the the things that it gives us may not necessarily be cited in a very meaningful way so a lot within the academic setting um, um, I, I think our assessments 
should be geared towards using the, the tools as a developmental tool. And I do know, for example, there are universities that don't subscribe to ch um, turn it in. Um, and there are, there are universities that use it more in a punitive way, and there are universities that say, okay, let's teach our students how to write, and so we use, we use turn it in, which is also have an algorithm within it, within it to actually detect uh, those various forms of writing. And, and, and so um, using the, the AI can be and has shown the potential of revolutionizing, is revolutionizing academic, um, and, and those questions of, of um, whether or not we, we should use it um, uh, is, is cert certainly surfacing uh, right now. I think a meaningful dis discussion that we can begin to, to uh, give attention to is how do we go about um, ensuring we teach the, the ethical use of those yes. various platforms. Yes. And I think, I think that in a, in a meaningful way needs to happen even now rather than um, being very uh, combative and, and saying, okay, I, it encourages this, I think, and we've seen many, many positive use in mm -hmm. able to use it in, in academic writing, in terms right. of helping discussion, um, engaging student engagement, knowledge check, and even verifying certain things, knowledge check, and verifying your content and, and, and so forth. So I, I don't know if Dr. Shakespeare is back on, but- I am. Okay, great, right. great. I've, I've been talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're all, we all learning from it, right? But you're, you're providing you want to, good you want contextual it? information that, that will help. But as technology advances, we're going to be interfacing with newer and more advanced versions of these things. And so rather than take the fear approach, which causes us to jump into panic mode, what we should potentially look at is how we write our assessments. Because if you write a question in such a way that I can drop it into one of these um, AIs and they can pull up an answer rather quickly, then it speaks more to how we write our assessments. How, how do we write them? Um, it is good to look at the, the benefits as well as the disadvantages of the resources that come to us. Um, mm -hmm. As you rightfully mentioned, some institutions do have turned it in for varying reasons. Even the, the chat GTIs, they're coming out with mechanisms to help us detect its yeah. use. So I believe the core here is how do we write our assessments? Yeah. You know, what are we expecting our students to produce, which takes us right back to home base, which is what are our objectives? What are we expecting our students? Mm -hmm. If we want them to just pretty much tell us what we told them, you know, or what is readily out there, then they're going to use what's available. But yeah. if we want to challenge them, if we want to test their creativity, if we want to stretch them a bit, and if right. we want to give them an opportunity to prove that the work they produce is really theirs, then we have to go back to home base and look at how we write assessments. Mm -hmm. So I am right. not interfering technology as I am into finding how we can capitalize on the, the, the plus side of it, but also putting some safeguards in place by looking at how exactly do we write our assessments. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Shakespeare. I like, you notice how this is all connected, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, we went from um, uh, uh, authenticity, you know, authentic assessments and so on. And then we went into the other direction of, you know, the technology mediated forms of assessments and really ensure how does authenticity find its way in there in that um, technological environment. I see Professor Delisle has a question, has a, a contribution. Go ahead, uh, go right ahead, Professor, Professor Delisle issue raises an important one. Um, firstly, I don't think the Caribbean, we've caught on fully with the technology and assessment. That's a big theme. Um, so in fact, next week, of course, uh, will be National Council Measurement Conference, which is part of AARA. And mm. there's a whole series of workshops on uh, video, et cetera, in assessment. Um, I missed them, um, that was last week. So, so clearly that's a trend. Um, and, and, and there is value even in, in for example, computer-based uh, testing, um, computer-adaptive uh, testing, because there are some item types that you can't get um, in a normal multiple choice that allows you to, to approximate the skill um, that you want to get. And of course, as you all will realize, you can use video, you can use pictures. So. Um, I, 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 I wish, well, firstly, there's a personal failure because that's something that I wanted to do before I left 
um, um, as a measurement person in medical school in 2006, and we had projects in the school of ed, we weren't able to, to get it off. But that is something that needs to be running um, strongly in the, in the Caribbean, um, certainly four levels, but it, it, it should begin in, in higher ed. Response to AI, well, um, firstly, and as was mentioned, and, and that's already mentioned, um, an authentic assessment is a challenge. Um, yes, uh, uh, computers know everything, uh, but <laughs> even in higher education, there is a lot that is unique, whether it's in the sciences um, and the, the knowledge of our industries, um, uh, the unique flora and fauna. And if you have a very authentic assessment that touches that, moreover, if you embed in it, uh, if it's embedded in the course, um, course, the course schedule, and students are required to produce samples, um, they're not going to be able to use AI for all of that. Mm -hmm. So, so one of the solutions might be uh, more strong, authentic assessments, um, and, and and students having to produce artifacts and work samples. Yeah, and and even professor, I've, I've seen even the traditional multiple choice being given the option that, okay, you've, cho you've chosen this, but there's also half of the mark to explain why this is the answer. And, and so you can begin to really deepen critical thinking. You can begin to, to think of, you know, more or less adaptive means uh, of, 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 of learning. And mm -hmm. I think the, the, the chat GBT, as, as you mentioned, Professor, is certainly something that we've seen uh, on the increase. And um, as Dr. Shakespeare said, we should not fear it. We should not fear it. We should embrace it. In fact, I, I mean, um, but again, the, the, uh, the algorithm the, the, the will only tell you what it knows. It tries mm. to. And I, I had a discussion with it, by the way, and I'll just perhaps nuance that. And I, I, I am someone who don't subscribe to learning styles. And so in, in my dialogue back and forth with ChatGPT, I found that it was referring a lot to that. And strangely enough, I said, uh, can you rephrase your, your, your uh, narrative? Because I don't subscribe to it. It's a myth. And immediately, ChatGPT went back and, and said that, yes, it has been debunked and so forth. Uh, so it recognized that it was learning from the discussion. So is that those sort of discursive practices, and for, even in literature, um, in, 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 in communication, we can use those means to actually uh, en enhance your, your teaching and learning uh, environment. I think one of the things, and going back to the question of technology, mm -hmm. and I mentioned it about the multiple pathways, is that, and I think this is where ChatGBT comes in, very crucial, is that we can begin to adapt, create adaptive uh, learning um, uh, approaches rather than the fixed uh, 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 ways of, of ensuring persons might take a, part, a particular uh, pathway that recognizes that, hey, this person is advanced, let me give them this question. Or perhaps let me give them this scenario because I recognize they're socioculturally located within the Caribbean. I can begin to nuance things about the Caribbean and, and those sort of things. So, so it's those sort of things I think the technology affords us. And just to summarize that we should certainly be careful um, in validating, fact check, I always fact check, um, and always teach our students the moral and acceptable use of, of the technology. Yes. I see a lot of loss gain even within our secondary schools when we were banning cell phones, left, right, and center, mm. and students were not learning the, 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 um, the, the proper use of this device. Uh, even in the workplace and what, when you can use it, how you can use it, and those different things. So those were opportunities lost in terms of technology because they feared it and they feared how... Again, um, I think teaching the moral uh, um, uh, use of these things is... In fact, I know that uh, Elon Musk and them are actually now advocating for a, a, a six-month slowdown because this is just going too fast. So it's going too fast. Um, so, yes. Yes. I guess the, the, the premise here is that um, instead of, of, of fearing and pushing away the technology, it's really try to, you know, it's better to try to understand it, um, how it works, the intricacies of it, and then um, also learn to, to adapt the way we, or adjust the way we construct assessments. And I see um, 
uh, Mrs. Stuart McCoy is also saying the same, that mm -hmm. um, she's agreeing with, Ms., with, with Dr. Uh, William Shakespeare. The way yes. items are constructed is crucial and faculty yeah. need to be trained on how to do so. All right. So very true. Very true. Um, and that takes us as we were in this 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 vein <laughs> to, to my next question. All right. And by the way, everyone, this is, you know, we, we, we're fairly, I would say, semi-formal. So it's a, very much a conversation. So feel free to type your, your questions in the chat and, um, and we will um, highlight them. I think, Candice, uh, you should be... <laughs> That was your question about the GPT. So, so <laughs> all right, thank you for that. So it really steers us now into the, the next question in terms of how we design assessments. Now, um, now, I think any of you could, could take a shot at this. We, we, we know that alignment is an integral part of curriculum and instructional design. And um, with the recent prevalence of alternative assessments and so on, this is even more important. Um, can any of you explain to us the importance of alignment? And I think I'll probably start with Dr. William Shakespeare first. Uh, can any of you explain to us the importance of alignment in higher education assessments, educational assessments? In other words, why is alignment so important? And then I think after that, I'll probably ask Professor Delia to chime in. Dr. Shakespeare? Your mic can, is off. Your mic is off. All right, well, we'll come back to her. Um, I don't know, Pr Prof, can you shed some light on that? Um, why is it, um, did, did, tell us a little bit about the importance of alignment in higher educational assessments, or why is alignment so important? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I prefer to give the life stories. So, you know, half of my life has been in higher education in the, in the FMS. And, yes. and and the other half would have been in in, in school assessment. I've always been in assessing um, at the school at the general school level. Mm -hmm. um, alignment was an important characteristic um, because we, we, we were we were thinking that uh, the general medical con council would um, accredit us, and it was actually listed as one of the qualities. Um, and 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 I I entered a system in which the system was not aligned they were using multiple true false items at the end of the third year um but a very rich curriculum i mean they are you know they are indeed experts in their area very rich uh curriculum experience and it was to try to align um so 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 we need to talk about it because um i've seen the discussion even in south africa um but i don't know why we don't have the discussion both at a national level and at a higher education yeah. level, so it's kind of confusing to me. We began to have that discussion um, in 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 the national um, section and and primarily, and uh, of course, I think the current CEO agrees about the the level of questions because mm -hmm. you, you you know you could give a a verbal choice question, but huh? It's, <laughs> what does that test? You know, is it you know a snippet of knowledge, mm -hmm. and, and and some of our consultants when we were reforming in 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 the FMS that tells us, I mean facts change all the time, um, standards mm -hmm. change. Um, so so if you teach a doctor, it's twenty seven point six. You know, in tw in twenty five years it might be twenty nine point seven. But they need to understand the particular principle. So high order questions and um, which could be difficult i i i admit and 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 i do like the point in the chat about training um we don't have i suspect sufficient training I, again i'm kind of trained um in the u.s with their licensing and certification tests and uh, people have all these opportunities to engage in workshops while they write questions that mm. uh, the persons collect but we don't have that so but i know that now that you you know um yourself and uh, dr L here, yeah we, we don't have questions like that, that and opportunities like that sorry <laughs> and, and let me just say this here as you mentioned that we do have um tomorrow we did speak on the heels of of what professor delia just mentioned in terms of training and so on in, in, in assessments 
we do. That's our next uh, session tomorrow afternoon. Um, assessments, I think, for, for student success, I think it is Dr. Hill. That is facilitated by our very own Dr. Hill. So if you haven't registered for it yet, by all means, do register. Um, and you know what he, he does, he really guides you in designing assessments. Of course, ticking off the, the authenticity part of it, the authentic part of it. And of course, alignment is part of it as well. So I think um, if you need training in that, um, you can definitely um, try to, to, to register. I see we have something in the chat with um, unable to register by the link. I'll ask Mr. Mohammed or Mr. Garcia to perhaps post the link in the chat like for that okay. session and um, to the assessment session tomorrow. And, um, and you can register there. All right, Mary Lou? All right, so- I think Dr. Chisholm has- Yes, a... go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead, um, Dr. Chisholm. I just wanted to chime in, Chair, on this sure. whole matter of, um, uh, you know, alignment that you were just talking about. And for us in higher education, this is a big part of how we understand um, good assessment tasks. Yes. Um, bigs and a number of co-researchers and so on would have popularized this whole notion of alignment, I think, in the, in the, in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, higher education, I think, has has bought into it, um, lock, stock, and barrel. So we, uh, <laughs> you know, we 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 tell our people, we help our people to understand the importance of writing objectives, mm -hmm. measurable objectives, and and that's where it must start from. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, yes. we teach in ways that those objectives can be realized. Mm -hmm. And we are going to assess the objectives. Gone are the days when we just put in a question or two for good measure or to say that <laughs> these are university scholars, university <laughs> students, they should know. Biggs and others have pointed mm -hmm. out the importance of the relationship between objectives, mm -hmm. what we are teaching, and how we assess. And the, and the assessment is a clear indication that you, you know, you're focusing on what you have taught and you want to determine whether or not those objectives have been realized. That's what we mean in, in higher education when we talk alignment. Yes. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and so um regularly we check for that, certainly at UWI in Aqua, where yes. we're looking when, when a paper, when a course comes to us, we're looking to what extent are the assessment tasks bearing any resemblance to what they said they would want to do in the course. And if they, they don't bear that kind of resemblance, <laughs> one might suggest that the alignment might not be in place. So it's, it's a big part of our quality assurance engagement, certainly at UWI and yeah. in, uh, in several institutions of higher education, especially those of us who came out of the, the English tradition. <laughs> yeah. Most certainly, you said a mouthful there and very, 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 very um, poignant. Uh, uh, I, if I there. may, I think Dr. Chi sure. really invoked uh, that that thought in my head. Yes. Because we 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 are now we are now uh, within that. You call it stock and barrel. <laughs> uh, it has been so in so enshrined that um, oftentimes this is this becomes like the the checklist. But I think what has been happening in the more recent times is, and we saw that shift moving towards that. And I think this is where the discussion of authentic discussion, of authentic assessment finds relevance. Because mm -hmm. you may actually have learning outcomes that, are, that you are able to go through the, the, the assessment and the teaching uh, dance or flow or connection, but its relation to the real world is so distant uh, because you have not updated your standards, you've not uh, really done that. And so I think this is where we also are seeing uh, the discussion of um, constructive alignment also aligning to industry. So is it how well are you? So it, in, in, if we get the learning outcomes wrong, then mm -hmm. that teaching is also yes. becomes outdated. And I think this is where, and I'm so happy that Dr. Chisholm, you brought that up because I think for many of us, we may look at the paper and, and I, I often, when I'm looking at programs, I say, but how do you translate this? Mm -hmm. And you begin to ask them, transfer, transfer, 
how do you cross, cross that boundary? And I remember the work of, of Engelstrom that really pushes the, the barrier for us to be in, and many times in, in, a, in a state of conundrum because we are wondering how do I teach a transfer if, although yes, I meet the paper-based learning outcomes, they are not able to do that. And I, might, I may be teaching the, 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 from the learning outcome standpoint, I might be meeting that constructive alignment to, to that setting, but am I constructively aligned when it comes right. to that? And I think this is where the, the authentic aspects comes in very, very um, in, impactful here. I, th I, see, I see Dr. Williams. Yeah, you know, uh, just before Dr. Williams comes in, chimes in, you know, it's so funny because that was my follow-up question about alignment between learning outcomes and assessment. So Dr. Chisholm, you just hit the nail on the head right there. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Dr. Williams, Shakespeare? Your mic is off. Her mic is on, but we're not here now. I, I, I think... Oh. All right, well, in the meantime, I see uh, Norma said in the chat, um, continuous professional development for faculty is necessary at all levels, especially now that AI is making such an impact in higher education. And this professional development does not have to lead to some kind of certification. So it's really uh, um, competency-based. Another uh, important, Ellis. Sorry? We were hearing her there. Yeah, I think she just dropped. So, the alignment, not just of alignments that are critical, especially as we continue to move more and more into out of the remote. I think network is given a little bit of an issue there. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, Mr. Mohammed to kind of liaise with, with Dr. Shakespeare in the background and um, we can take that. All right. Yes, we're sorry about um, that. But, but, um, but I, I really like what, what Nova is saying in the chat that it doesn't necessarily have to be a sort of certification per se, but it can be just um, competency based um, sort of training, even if it's not for a certificate, an official you know, degree or certification on, on that level. Um, definitely, if it's as simple as just going uh, uh, to a workshop or a webinar to, or, or doing some research on it, um, that will also help. Speaking of webinar, we also had uh, a session not too long ago, and I think it's on our YouTube channel, um, that Dr. Jones uh, did a couple of weeks ago on designing a measurable learning outcomes, I believe it was. I may have yes. yeah. the title wrong, but it was on learning outcomes. Um, and you can definitely subscribe, visit and subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'll also ask Mr. Mohammed to post the link to our YouTube channel <laughs> there so you can, you can see this recording and other recordings that we have uh, there in light of what we were talking about. So it wasn't meant to be a shameless plug, but it's just additional resources that may be useful for you. Prof, I see you have your hand raised. Go right ahead, please. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I, I, I still very formal. Um, I, I really enjoy that um, comment uh, by, again, Dr. Chitislam. Um <laughs> But again, <laughs> he's not saying it, but he's implying that... <laughs> He says it's a British based uh, uh, trend. But mm -hmm. again, it's a whole trend that was missed in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, we had to study and, 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 and read the issue because the issue had been taken up by the General Medical Council of the UK. And that's what we are trying to get accreditation for in, in that period. Well, I, I mean, we thought we would get accreditation. Eventually, um, we had to form our own accreditation body. But that was a critical discussion on why, on judging the assessment system in the Faculty of Medical Sciences prior to 1998 and, mm -hmm. and, and the new one that, that was installed. But that kind of discussion, I think, um, needs uh, to, to be driven. It needs to be in the air um, because I think in terms of our society, because I, I, I do see a lot of, um, I'm normally team chair for, for the accreditation and registration exercises, and it's a lot. Thank God I can't do anyone now. But um, assessment could be one of the weakest areas <laughs> um, in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I, I, I suspect it is, and we've discussed that. Um, so it's a very weak area. Um, yeah. And if you're looking at ensuring that UE remains the premier uh, in, uh, um, institution, not only aligning uh, 
to the outcomes that we want, but expanding assessment so that it 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 it, it, it touches all parts of the five mm -hmm. E learning cycle, um, in inquiry based learning. Um, so that is something that hopefully will happen. Definitely, yes. definitely. Yes. I see uh, Dr. Shakespeare is 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 in as well, and she mentioned that another important element. Uh, and thank you so much for that, uh, Prof. Another important element is the reality that alignment is a key marker of quality in instructional design. I think what seems to be the, the, the premise here is that um, in terms of alignment, um, one of the, the foundational parts of alignment, it really starts with the learning outcomes and then it sort of snowballs to the other elements of whether it's assessment or just instruction and so on. So, so I like that. I see Dr. Chisholm, like you're about to say something there. <laughs> Well, it, not, not, not really, but I, I agree with you. <laughs> it, it, it starts there. It starts mm -hmm. there. And, you know, um, certainly the teaching act is important um, mm -hmm. as we go along and we engage in formative assessment or ongoing yeah. assessment. And um, we, we need to ensure that this is continually done. In, yes. in, in our teaching and, and I'm certain um, CETL has been at the forefront of that, yeah. helping persons to understand the importance of uh, engaging in formative assessment mm -hmm. when more prior to certain it is CETL has been so active in our on our campuses. Um, summative assessment was the biggie, yeah. was the mm -hmm. big thing uh, yeah. we were pushing um, for engagement in multiple ways with mm -hmm. formative assessment, learning from that and offering feedback as we go along. This is something that we still, we are still challenged by. And I like the, the, a, a term that has been coined again by some of our British um, people, assessment specialists. They talk mm -hmm. more about feed forward, using it yes. within an assessment milieu um, you know, formative assessment as a kind of feed forward, what mm -hmm. we actually do with our PhD or our doctoral students. <laughs> we work with them, we look at their paper and we give them some ideas yeah. as to how they can move forward. And, mm -hmm. and so, so much of the feedback that we must associate with assessment traditionally has been, you did not do this well, this is awful. Um, <laughs> students, students want to know how could they have done better or what do they need to know to, to improve? So I really like the concept of a feed forward as yeah. a game, a feedback. A feedback. <laughs> and what you said there, naturally, I don't know you're on a roll today because it just segues nicely into the next question I had. <laughs> um, <laughs> I kid you not. Um, because, you know, we were talking about authentic assessments, alternative assessments. Then we, we spoke a little bit about um, AI and technology, um, computer-based assessments and so on. And then we went, it we naturally transitioned to that part of this, the discussion on alignment and um, how it feeds through different components, whether it's a course or program and um, instruction and so on, and assessments. My next question really is about, well, let me just, let me just put it like this. Um, it has always been said that assessments, um, educational assessments um, are not just about grading, but they're also about providing meaningful feedback to our students, all right? Um, and I guess this is probably what, what Dr. Chisholm is saying as feel forward or, or feed forward, so to speak. So Dr. Hill, I'll start with you. How, how would you describe meaningful feedback on students' assessments? What does that look like? Or how would you, what is your conceptualization of it? I, I think the, the, the start of the, the feedback is really understanding what it needs to make a student be successful uh, in your course. Yes. And not every student understand uh, the traditional ways in which we, we assess. And so I think what it does, it gives the opportunity for, for um, the course designer to ensure that they are, they are using a data-driven approach. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that they're using a data-driven approach. I know there's been moved to really focus on student-centered approaches, but sometimes we use that more as a word in saying. But if we, if we really are to be student-centered, then we are to start with the student at the end. What, mm -hmm. what do we, how do we need to design our course? And we, 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 we've seen the science, we've seen the science of chunking, we've seen the science of, uh, you know, too much, too much uh, of cognitive overload. We, we know what, what it means like. So learning science has given us many aspects in how we can, but yet we are still wedded towards the more episodic. And we do know that there are, there are certain very strong stipulations from uh, the accreditation and, and from industry and especially boards of certification. But I still think that we can, we can begin to think about innovative ways and even using technology, even using chat GPT, even using chat um, GPT, for example, to begin to uh, curate what a, 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 a feedback um, process can look like or what some feedback phrases can look like in terms of your students. There are, there are um, um, in a very meaningful ways, that we can also demystify the need that students need to get feedback necessarily from the instructor or the facilitator. And I think we can deepen that commitment to, towards that sort of community-based peer um, um, feedback approach where, where I know that I'm um, in a higher education setting. Everyone, don't come with tabular, it's not the tabular rooster, you come with an experience mm -hmm. and therefore you can deepen, you can deepen your, your, your engagement with the course by integrating feedback from peers. So this is how I see it. I think in order for persons to be successful, because I, I like what Norma said in, 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 the, in the chat in terms of mm -hmm. that continuous, and I think it's an attitude. It's an attitude more because yes. there are some persons who are, there are many persons who are wedded by certificates and so forth, but the research is showing clear. The learners who are the resilient ones are the ones who go forward and develop their own personal learning environment. I, I know Professor, um, um, just he passed away recently, edX, leaders of, of learning um, 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 and, my, and certainly it's clear that you can use a combination of, of topologies in which to really get you um, within that. So I think I've said, uh, but I'll give, I'll give my other peers uh, yeah. time to have really re on We on actually that. have a couple, a couple of sub questions. So I'm going to ask a question to Professor Delisle in just a bit, but let me just, um, I see uh, Dr. Kalu is saying in the chat, uh, transfer of knowledge is context dependent and really only occurs in apprenticeship or research situations where students have the opportunity to apply knowledge in a real environment. So I guess we are alluding to uh, authentic um, context there. And uh, Dr. Kalu is saying, I'm not sure that the paper and pencil assessments or even any practicum can really be authentic <laughs> and test more than low levels of knowledge application. I don't think that it is necessary, necessarily a bad thing as transfer is dependent of confidence in principles, dependent on confidence in principles of knowledge. What might the panel think? That's a mouthful. Yes. So, <laughs> yes. so before we go further in terms of um, uh, feedback, I don't know if any of you want to take want to tackle that question, so to speak. I'll read it again. Transfer of knowledge is context dependent and really only occurs in apprenticeship or research situations where students have the opportunity to apply knowledge in a real environment. I am not sure that the paper and pencil assessments or even many practicum can really be authentic and test more than low levels of knowledge application. I don't think that this, necess this is necessarily a bad thing as knowledge, uh, sorry, as transfer is dependent on confidence in principles of knowledge. What might the panel think of this? Let me take a shot at that. Um, sure. I think, um, well, I do recognize the panel has been quite expert in terms of the literature, which is fantastic. Um, in terms of this particular area, um, I think it, in terms of our pra practical and uh, other such episodes, I think that we should um, perhaps make better use of uh, the principles of work-based learning. Uh, my, the late Michael Erao, before, of course, uh, is, is passing, um, 
came into the area of 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 of, of, of work-based learning and allowed us to see how that uh competence in terms of professional identity could, could be built so i think okay. that there's room for improvement as we have this these types of conversations and um yeah. Wherever we have how much three professional we have management, um, medicine, teaching, mm -hmm. uh, all of these are technically professional faculties, and 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 once those principles are understood, you can apply it uh, to the practical. That's what we tried to do um, back in those days in the medical school. Definitely. Anyone want to take another shot as well, or, or chime in on, on that? Yeah, I I, yeah. I would perhaps. Um, um, Dr. Kalu point to the it, it's, it's one of those things that is sometimes contradictory um, because we do see a lot of and, and we see for example the, 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 the industry standards where you do things like Microsoft Systems Engineer and there's a very strong um, uh, use of my, a multiple choice mm -hmm. and but those multiple choice items really really invoked the the uh, and, and i think golkers judith golkers and her colleagues in in the early, early 2000s and late 1990s speak to what is called a framework that can be used because you can certainly invoke the social context you can certainly invoke the physical context and i think for many of us we use for the physical context where we would use in service we recognize the, the need for practical, um, um, so we do we do the apprenticeships. So they do uh, before you go to apprenticeship, you need to at least have a basic foundation, and um, and notwithstanding, we do need to have that. And so to be able to complete a task, you can actually allow students to to cognitively explain what tasks need to be go to go through. But you have a phase two, which allows them. Uh, when they're doing the apprenticeship, to actually uh, actually do so, I think I, I think that sort of balance is needed in programs. I and I and, I, and so although there is um, sometimes the the misconstruing of of what it means, and I and that that is why I said uh, you know I I, I I I like the idea of being able to cross boundaries, and I think this is one of the skills we need to give our students or allow our students to to develop. Um, is that how well they can transfer is how well you give them those skill sets in, in being able to do that. Because obviously, um, 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 how do I do a multiple choice and how do I translate a multiple choice? I think this is where we need to really give them those test taking skills. And so I know Dr. Zephyrin, you'll be doing a session on multiple choice for students. And I, yes. I'd really want if we can put the link, if you can share that with your students. Uh, because we really want to go beyond just the the um, you know we're looking at metacognition and all those different things, but it is one of those things that I I know that is uh, you know we, we're being contradicted you know uh, that's that's how I think about it, but we need a we need a balance we need a balance and I think we we know that because many programs um, you know for for example teaching who, I remember my lovely days of practicum. I remember my lovely days where, where you know, okay, let me use the pre-map principle, uh, group congruency, and I'm showing that I know how to do it. Uh, obviously, I had to have that, uh, that basic foundational of the theory. And mm -hmm. I think this is where you, you, you have the practicum. It's not just one sitting. You have multiple instances, and, and this is where you have that, that apprentice and, and, and the, the, the more knowledgeable other that you can learn from them. And, mm -hmm. and so I think is that marry, Dr. Kalu, that I think that needs to take place, that marry between the traditional and obviously competency base is here to stay. Definitely. Um, uh -huh, go ahead, Dr. Chisholm. Yeah, I, I, I believe, though, that the practicum depends on how it is constructed. Yes. yes. If you can give you opportunities for real transfer of knowledge. Um, so it depends on how we engage in practicum and what kind of coaching is yeah. taking place during the practicum situation. If the practicum is not well designed, it can be problematic and perhaps the transfer of knowledge that Dr. Kalu is talking about might not really be realized. 
So I, that, that's my two cents work. I like <laughs> more I than like two cents. <laughs> I like what you said there with coaching in yes. the practical because that's a big that's part important. of it. And it ties back. I think I heard someone say something. But no, I was I saying that is so true. Yes, yes, definitely. And I think um, the coaching part of it, I guess it ties to the feedback as well. To, 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 mm -hmm. But I don't know if you could elaborate, Dr. Chisholm, um, why is why is meaningful feedback so important, even in the context of a practicum um, or whatever practicum it might be? Why is why is feedback so important? Or why what is the point um, of it as opposed to just getting agreed? Well, yeah. Yeah, it is very important. Unfortunately, um, a number of times as we do it now, um, the students sometimes don't even pay attention and read it in some <laughs> disciplines because students are so focused on the grade or the mark that was earned for a particular task. But more and more, uh, even accreditation um, organizations are concerned about the quality of feedback. And feedback. I'm speaking now from um, our own engagement with our quality assurance people and accreditation body here. Uh, yes. And the students complain oftentimes that they do not get enough feedback. Mm -hmm. um, feedback should help our students learn more. Yes. Feedback should help them to understand where they are in terms of the achievement of the learning outcomes or the learning objectives that we have set for that course and certainly give them direction as to how they might improve what they're doing. So yes. feedback should also drive learning even as assessment ought to drive learning. Uh, but there is this whole thing about socialization. We have been socialized into feedback in a particular way. For instance, I use a rubric in many of my courses that I've taught. And unfortunately, when I give, if I give back that rubric without writing a few lines about the assignment, the student says, but you have not given me any feedback. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Yes, yes. They have been yes. socialized into receiving a certain kind of feedback. It must be a statement and a qualitative mm. statement and, and so on. And mm. um, as we go forward, both faculty and student will need to learn more about how feedback is given. Yes. And how do you use the information mm -hmm. that is communicated to you in feedback? And as I'm on this, um, we here at Mona some time ago, and St. Augustine might want to look at it, and, and, and um, Barbados gave mm -hmm. in. We at, at Mona was looking at a suite of tools by Feedback Fruits, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, that would assist yeah. us to give feedback to our students because they do complain that they're not getting enough and right. feedback fruits offers you know technologies that we might be able to to utilize to improve feedback in multiple courses that we offer across this university so i hope saint augustine and and cave cave will look at um feedback fruits in particular mm -hmm. like their suite of tools we don't yet have them. That's something we might want to talk about. <laughs> and look, Dr. Hill, he's quick on the draw. He just placed the link in the chat. So <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I, this, this is technology for you because yeah. <laughs> and I, 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 I say this all the time that it, the how is also important. Yes. Because yes. oftentimes we, uh, some persons may get offensive to how we translate that. Mm -hmm. I think we need to understand that there are power struggles within the classrooms and teaching and learning. And how do you translate that is just as important. So I do know yeah. a lot of us subscribe to the sandwich method. You really try and find something nice that you want to mm -hmm. tell to the students. Find something nice to tell some person. Yeah. <laughs> try to find something nice first. And then you, you really hit them with reality. And then yes. you end with how can how can they improve? Uh, yeah. And I, I think that three-step model has helped me throughout the years you, uh, um, in yeah. making 
this thing more meaningful for them. And audio, I know, I'm, it, it, it will be so, because sometimes we are wedded with text and we, we think that it has to be text. An audio, an audio clip, a, a, a screencast. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so we can, feedback can be different ways. Or it can be even after you, you um, do your, your, your mark over or your annotations that you invite them for 10 minutes um, yes. on, on that. So I think it's those, those different things. We, but we do know it's time, the time consuming aspect of it and the timeliness of it is also important because you want that to be, if you're thinking of student success, then you have to think of how do, when do I do this in order to ensure that my students are successful. That's Definitely. very, very important. I was actually going to touch on that. A little, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Dr. Uh -huh. one, one thing that I have done and one thing that has worked well points that I can actually put into a single paper and say, okay, this is feedback for everybody. And when I have specific challenges or weaknesses with an individual paper, then I would make consultation time or speak with that student or email that student directly. But where issues right. are common, those I would group in a common response. And, and you are so right. I don't always write. Sometimes it's a video. Sometimes it's an audio clip that they get. And right. it, it's helpful. Additionally, in Moodle also, what I've learned to do is I've learned to create responses that I can drag and drop. Yes. So I've created my <laughs> own feedback supermarket. Mm -hmm. Sometimes yes. I have to tweak. But generally, if, 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 if rather than give them a vague response, this is not clear. I want them to mm -hmm. understand what yeah. makes it not clear. Yes. And, and yes. to piggyback on the whole matter of rubrics, mm -hmm. I don't just give my students the rubric. Before, when, when I discuss the assessment, I go through and I say to them, this is what I'm expecting. So you yeah. have in your hand full marks for your assignment. You mm -hmm. decide which ones you want to keep the full marks for by mm -hmm. responding appropriately to the task that has been assigned. Yeah. So they, they don't just get the rubric and then they say, oh, I didn't see it. I actually go through it before. Yes. There you know are what? sometimes travelers because students join your class late, but the whole mm -hmm. matter of going discussing it with them before, yeah. and then yes. of course yeah. ensuring that they understand what you're and looking that, for and why it is they did not make that mark. That is important. Yes. The sandwich and, method is good, of course. You have to you have to make you don't want your student to feel like everything was bad with your paper. Right. So even if it is the penmanship <laughs> alone that you yes. have from the net, you want them to feel like there is promise, you know, even though they're adults, adults also want to see that mm -hmm. response. It's no longer the tick or the smiley, but they want to see that you appreciate yes. something in what they've done or that what they've done means something. I like that you brought that point in with the rubric. What, what, just to share some of my, what I do, um, when I'm giving feedback, I kind of fold it into the rubric. So, the students or participants know exactly the area that was that needs a lot of work and what really where they excel you know so what i do is give i, I use a rubric i put the marks in the rubric where you know so they see where they got most of their marks where things were not so not so strong and then i give some general comments after um on that particular assignment and if they want a, a consultation then um then that can be arranged but most times, at least in my experience, I found that um, once I use the rubric, instead of just giving, and I also give detailed feedback on the actual um, student uh, work, yeah, the documents. So they get detailed feedback, feedback, they get general feedback, and they also get um, the general thing on the rubric, for example, in my learning or Moodle, sorry, where they can, um, see, where you could build the rubric in Moodle, and then you, you literally just click, <laughs> just a click away. And then it's um it's so most I don't really get too many complaints um in terms of that in terms of feedback, but um in fact sometimes you might find that students might might ask okay well uh, how did I get how did I saw a loser mark I, I didn't get full marks for this segment how 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 come and then you could pull up the script and you show them exactly where um that 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 certainly has helped for me. Um, I'm just watching the time so I'm gonna kind of wind down in just a bit the the the, the discussion. But before we go any further, um, I think this is a question that I really need, we really need to address. Um, because it is something that, you know, we just spoke about feedback, 
and how the, it could be a lot, um, giving detailed feedback, especially to a large class. What I'm about, well, <laughs> with, with that, if you have a class of 800 students or, or 500 students or even 100 students, it's still a lot because very often you're not just teaching that course alone. All right, so we know that educational assessments have become quite um, pedantic or stressful, <laughs> um, a stressful experience for both faculty and students. Uh, while faculty may experience a great deal of stress in grading assessments and providing meaningful feedback, which we just spoke about, um, to large classes in a short space of time, students have also experienced stress in unprecedented ways. And this is why we're also doing sessions later this week for that target students, um, <clears throat> which I'll ask uh, Mr. Mohammed and Mr. Garcia to place the links in the chat on those sessions. But very recently, we, when the University of the West Indies resumed face-to-face -face, um, assessments, students communicated very disturbing red flags, so to speak, on their scripts. And I was alluding to those earlier. In, and this indicated that they were feeling very overwhelmed or unequipped to cope with assessments. Um, I think I'll start with Dr. Chisholm. How do we make assessment, the assessment process less stressful for faculty? Uh, thank you so much, Chair. You know, um, it, we talk about less stressful for, for faculty, but we also might think about less stressful for students. And one of the things that had been um, thinking about recently and talking to some faculty about is this whole notion of the mid-semester. Why mm. is it that we at UA, <laughs> certainly where I am, in almost all courses must think that we must, we must, we must have a mid-semester. Hmm. We must, and mid-semesters are run like a second exam. Tradition. You know, it's just tradition. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is just tradition. There is nothing in the book. There is nothing in the policy documents that says that this is compulsory. So we engage in these activities and make it more stressful for students that's the first thing mm -hmm. and i speak and i speak um in in this regard in a in a in a, in a self-conscious way as a parent as well <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> because i do have a son at you right now right and he's going through some of these and i hear some of the complaints Mm -hmm. um, that he has about these uh, mid-semester exams, you know, or mid-semester tests. And, and it really is extremely stressful for students when they have five, six, seven, and uh, I'm told in engineering more than that, uh, yes. mid-semester. Because but, in, in engineering, their content is so large. Yeah. But let um, me ask you, let me ask, let me just chime in a little bit. So what about, because for me as a student, um, I knew, I learned, well, I wouldn't say very early, but I, I realized final exams were not my kind of thing. It wasn't my, it wasn't my strongest suit. So for me, I was, I was very happy when we had midterms or that, you know, period of, of in-course assessments, um, because that was the opportunity I used to kind of um, excel, knowing very well that I was not good at final exams. So how do you strike that balance in light of what you just said about, you know, you, we may not necessarily need um, midterms per se, but how do how do you speak to that? So let's say if, if we if we were to take out midterms, wouldn't that sort of deny students who might be like me? Who I think is it taking out a lot of it is nomenclature. You know, what do we call them? So, for mm -hmm. instance, in course tests mm -hmm. or in course assignments and so mm -hmm. on. But this whole notion of this it's mid semester as a sit down exam. Yeah. Right. Mid-semesters are oftentimes run like end-of-year exams. That's what I'm talking about. Yes. So, so if we were to, to give ongoing tests, the mm -hmm. research is saying to us, frequent testing works. Right. Small right. quizzes works. Mm -hmm. Work, rather. So <laughs> um, how we do these things is, impor is important. But, but, but a large mid-semester that is run like a final right. is what okay. is problematic. So it, it's extremely stressful for the students. Mm -hmm. It is, might be a little easier to mark for some faculty members, 
for some areas. And I understand why some faculty like them. They might be a little easier to mark than to mark um, several pieces of assignment during the semester. So yes. we've got to think about that because that is also very stressful. And I now speak as a lecturer myself, um, <laughs> you know, when we have so much graduate studies work to, to mark, and my God, that can be, can be stressful. Um, of course, there's no easy answer as to how we can make it less stressful. Marking is indeed, um, can indeed be a very stressful experience for both faculty and, 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 and students. I think smaller bites is what yes. perhaps we will yes. need to look at. I want to go very, because I'm mindful of the time, I'm going to just, first of all, we're just going to take a little extra five minutes because I think this conversation is going quite um in depth. So I just want to hear from Dr. Shakespeare and then Prof, and then we'll kind of wrap up with the last question. And um and yeah, so, so Dr. Shakespeare, go right ahead. Thank you. Um, just to, to add to what Prof said, sometimes we have some major projects at the end that carry a lot of marks. Giving, breaking those up into smaller bits that allow for you to give students formative assessment, treat it as a formative assessment, giving them feedback, sometimes takes the edge off. I, I find my students get a different reaction when you say an assignment or a, or a test versus when you say a mid-semester exam. So I do agree with what he's saying. And one way you could look at making an adjustment is to take those larger end of year pieces of assessment that carry so much weight and break it up into stages or phases so the students can actually get some feedback. So the quality you get at the end will also improve. What yes. your students and, yes. and the overarching aim is for our students to do well. And if we can help them in that way, which we should, then by all means, that's an option for us to take, to give them a stage one, a stage two. And of course, with that feedback, they should be able to complete the last part. And so too with the assessments, rather yeah. than that big mid-semester. And the truth is, we never think that a student carrying eight modules has all eight pieces of assessment to contend with at that time either, mm -hmm. because we don't plan with the other modules in mind. We just think about our courses alone. Indeed. So if we were to stop and take checks, of all of that, it can become overwhelming. And I wanted to drop something in before you wrap up. The matter mm -hmm. of after we've assessed, how do we assess our assessment? Do we do item wow. analysis? Do we sit as a family and say, in this particular discipline, let us look at the assessment. Let us look at how each student reacted to each um, item. What, was it mm -hmm. too difficult? Was it too easy? How do we adjust? So assessing our assessment instrument is an important element that we have to add to the discussion at some point. I like that. I like that point about taking the time, almost like reflective practice, yeah? Um, and seeing what items, what were the problem areas? And I think that informs the kind of feedback and the instruction that we adjust or amend uh, thereafter. I see Dr. Hill did a, 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 very true, very true Dr. Hill. He stated that there's a need to address our assessment design to ensure that we do not overassess, that we do not overassess our learning outcomes. Sometimes we retest the same learning outcomes multiple times without a full view of how students should be able to address a successful course experience. That is very true, and especially it becomes more um, pedantic, and you know, because for the student and for faculty, because it's multiple courses they're doing at the same time. So I like that 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 there. Um, I want to go to Professor Delisle, yeah, and for you to chime in, sir. Yeah, it, it's it's the discussion was very rich. I just want to say agree that um, we should go towards smaller bits. If you look at a, 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 a American course schedule, you wouldn't see a whole lot of end the, in the year exams. You'll see it in, in, in bits. And sometimes it's just necessary uh, for the student um, to get there. I really love uh, um, Professor Dr. Chellum's uh, discussion of the assessment culture. It's mm -hmm. something you've seen in, 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 in other examination oriented societies the, the 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 difficulty that hong kong has has had even though they've removed you know many of the exams they they face challenges in instituting assessment uh uh for for learning um even though it's part of the um their their structure um so but there are successes um and apparently once people understand i think one of the problems we get in Trinidad and Tobago with the higher education 
is that there is insufficient uh, formative assessment and feedback at the uh, school level and that feeds back into where we are now but students learn quickly what feedback is one one quick point about um, solving this this problem um, I remember when, when we were trying to redesign the assessment system in in, F, in FMS you realize that okay even if you're going to do a, 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 a end of semester um, a summative assessment a modular uh, assessment then use first um, the formative use of of, of, of summative assessment um, and and so we gave people back the paper um, lecturers discussed the paper the lecturers themselves got feedback on the items in terms of very well we had the technology very detailed <laughs> I, I no no well it was it, it's nothing but it was, it was there um yes. it, it, it was our job um yes. my, my job um <laughs> they they got the feedback and we found that not only did the lecturers understand uh what the students were learning better but also they were able to improve the items right thank you so much thanks so much I, I, I want to, no, I was going to ask one more question, but I have a pre-ending question, right? because I think this is a very important um, concern. Um, and I'll just make it general, so any one of you could chime in. Um, how can we make educational assessments more inclusive? Because we know assessments, you know, you have to cater for a diverse um, or differentiated um, learners, all right? And for example, the, the differently abled and so on. I should maybe tweak that question a bit. What are some considerations? What things do we need to consider as educational practitioners? What, some th what are some of the things that we need to consider to make our assessments more inclusive? And then I'll go to my last question. Yeah. I, I think I could perhaps start by taking a bite at this. I think one of the things that we need to do is to sensitize our students to be, you know, really be open about the, the, the assessment phobias and, and so forth. And um, there is no way we would know how we are to meet our students if we don't know that information. So I think the, the data. So this is where diagnostic uh, um, aspects mm -hmm. of assessment comes yes. in very important yes. to, re to really know your students. And that sort of evaluation, sort of reconnaissance needs to be happening throughout the course as you go along. And uh, it, it's important because um, Many the culture, as, as Professor Chisholm <laughs> and Delilah, as we, there is a culture that would perhaps not allow or, 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 or kind of support our students. Um, and so there, there are many students who are struggling. There, there are certain labels that they don't want to be ascribed to. And so I think it's those sort of dialogue that needs to take place. And I think what we're doing at Settle is mm -hmm. important because we are now recognizing that while we, we're focusing on teaching and learning, we cannot ignore the learning, we cannot ignore the learners. Yes. And helping students understand that, hey, we are part of your success. And reach out, come out and reach out. So I think that sort of, mm -hmm. uh, the inclusive approach is number one, ensuring you, you make them aware that these, these are things that are happening. And so having uh, informational sessions, but at the cost level, at the course level, I think using a more data-driven approach, using those diagnostic means, using those knowledge check. I love to use knowledge check because oftentimes, mm -hmm. especially in the online setting, um, because students may just say they complete this, but then you may put a little Easter egg in there to really see who's really going through the course, um, um, you know, the course experience and how they're doing it. Some of them really have difficulty navigating uh, different, um, you know, platforms and so forth. Yes. So you really want to use those different things. So that, that would be my two cents. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Hill. Um, and very quickly, uh, and before we get to our next question, our last question for this afternoon, um, you know, I think as we were talking about feedback and and um, on assessments, whether and meaningful feedback at that, I think part of it, um, and I think Dr. Shakespeare alluded, alluded to it, um, where we take a step back and take some time to, to reflect on what worked for us or what 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 resonated with our students, what we did right and what we could work on. Yeah. And I think a big part of that, a big avenue, a good avenue for that is to take a look at the uh student course evaluation, um, course experience review. All right. And and otherwise known as CR. <laughs> all right. 
Uh, now every course on the on the on the on, at the university um, is evaluated in that regard. So that's basically where students give feedback on their experiences in their courses. So whether it is based on the assessments, whether it's you know on the instruction, because we did talk about alignment and instructional design and so on and assessments and so on. So it's something that you know we might be might that some of us may not be aware of, but it's definitely useful. So always encourage your students to complete that survey because it's something that would impact, would give you insight in terms of your effectiveness, all right? And what, what worked in your course and what needs to be tweaked. So my, my, the final question for this afternoon's proceedings, and I guess this could go for the entire panelists, the, all our panelists here this afternoon. Um, in one word, or maybe one or two words, yeah, give or take. Um, <laughs> In your opinion, what should higher educational assessments look like in the 21st century? I'll start with Dr. Shakespeare, ladies first, and, um, and since you are first on my screen, so we'll <laughs> start with you and then go to, to, to the others. Thank you. Um, what do we know about adult learners and what they expect? They want to have they don't want to be restricted to a particular approach. So it might be easier to set multiple choice, but does that allow everybody the opportunity to truly um, express themselves in the way they best know? So do we give them more, use more differentiation um, approaches in our assessment? So giving them opportunities to potentially do well across different types of assessment. I think that's what we should be looking for opportunities too. They also like the opportunity to express themselves more. So. Yeah. While we're wary of the, the affordances of AI, they also want to be able to, to write and say what it is. Mm -hmm. And again, as Dr. Hill mentioned earlier, getting to know your students is, is important in that regard. Uh, let me go to, to Dr. Chisholm. Um, what do you think um, higher educational assessments look like? I do have 13 to 15 weeks to get to know our learners. What do we know My about goodness. them? One thing sometimes we overlook is the matter of accommodations. Do your students mm -hmm. need special accommodations and do you advise them to seek it so that when you are preparing assessments for them, that is also taken into consideration. Definitely. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Shakespeare. Um, Dr. Chisholm, what, what? Well, you said one or two words. Um, yeah. so it's it's, it's Person, more personalized, definitely, I think, and definitely uh, more authentic. I think last week we, we yes. were talking to some people from Canada on AI. Um, Dr. Hill was there, and they also were suggesting that with the, with the AI challenge, authentic assessment will, will have to take a greater place in right. the assessment landscape yes. of higher education. <laughs> um, very good, very good. Uh, Professor Delay? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Innovative, okay. technology-based, and authentic. Mm -hmm. um, for the same reasons that was mentioned, mm -hmm. the technology-based, I, 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 I have a small group here at the School of Ed called the Public Examinations Group, um, and I Maybe I wasn't convinced myself, but I've indicated them that look, the future is in uh, video, etc. You can pick up mm -hmm. based yes, assessments, mm -hmm. and uh, we need to experiment with that here in the Caribbean yes. higher education. Excellent. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Hill, in two words, one or two words, um, you go right ahead, sir. Okay, sorry, I was muted. Um, three words, I think Dr. Chisholm took one of my words, personalized, and if it's personalized, it gives you an opportunity for those pathways. Um, it's, not, it's not just a, a, a line, linear, it gives you the pathway to, uh, and this is where technology comes in. So Pro Professor Delisle, the technology certainly is, is technology assisted, helps that sort of personalized, um, to support that personal view. All right, I'll end there. Otherwise, we'll speak forever because this is a topic that we all love and passionate about. Yeah. Good. All right. All right. Thank you so much for that. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of our, of our uh, 
informal, well, I shouldn't say formal, because it was an informal sort of conversation on, um, on, on assessments in higher education. Um, we do have, uh, we want to hear from you, speaking of feedback, because we just spoke about feedback and hearing from your participants. We would also like to hear from you uh, what, what you thought of this session, if it was useful, and hopefully it was useful. Um, you can certainly uh, place a comment in the chat, but we also have, uh, uh, or you could place a thumbs up in the chat, that works. Um, Natasha said, very informative. Thank you so much, Natasha. Um, but we're also going to provide you with a link, um, an evaluation link, where you can just click on that link and provide us with some feedback, what we did uh, fairly good, what we can work on, what, what more you'd like to see from us, or, you know, a topic that you would like us to explore. Um, and we'll be very happy to, 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 to do that. All right. Uh, so we have the, the schedule of this week's proceedings. Um, we also shared Monday morning mentors, which is how can I adapt popular, five popular classroom assessment techniques to the online classroom. So it's all about assessments, as you know, this week. So um, you can access that anytime during this week. Um, tomorrow afternoon at 1.30, we have a webinar by Dr. Hill. He's a facilitator. Alternative assessments for student success. We've spoken about alternative assessments here um, and by extension, authentic assessments and feedback and assessment design. He mentioned that as well in, 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 in the conversation. So um, if you haven't registered for that, by all means, please register um, if you'd like to attend. Um, and we have our... Um, mastering the, these two sessions, mastering multiple choice questions and coping with assessment anxiety uh, targeted at students. All right, so you may attend as well, but we also we wanted to really address the, the conundrum of assessments at this particular time um, from both angles or multiple angles. So we, we have taken the time to, to, to address it from the faculty perspective or the faculty side. And we also want, would like if you can share that link to, with your students so they can attend as well. And those two sessions occur or are scheduled um, on Wednesday, mastering multiple choice questions at 1.30. And then we have another one on Thursday, coping with assessment anxiety um, at 1.30 on Thursday. All right, and this I think is necessary because right now they're at the end of midterms and then going into final exams for the semester. So um, definitely share those links with your students. We'll, we'll definitely appreciate that. Um, again, Keep in mind that you want to keep your assessments very practical, practical, collaborative, um, uh, creative. I know we have some persons here, Dr. Hill and Dr. Jones in the chat. They're very much about um, creativity and so on in, in, in education as well. Um, and even authentic. I forgot to mention that. All right. So uh, we thank you for being here with us, um, joining us in this conversation. And if you have any questions that you would like us to, to, to address, by all means, you can, you can uh, post those questions to our Yama group. We have a Yama group of Yama community where you can pose a question and we can answer. If, and we can even uh, uh, send those questions to members of the panel, um, Dr. Professor Delisle, Dr. Chisholm, Dr. Shakespeare, um, who can also um, shed some light on it. We have a question here, in a general sense, to what extent do assessments in higher education support critical and creative thinking? Ooh, that's a bonus question. I don't know if anyone wants to take that very quickly, but um, we can answer that very quickly, maybe in a, just about a 30 seconds, yeah? Any of the panelists would like to take a shot at that? I see Professor Delilah is laughing or smiling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it's, it's not possible if it's a... I, there is a lot of progress being made in performance assessments and judging critical and creative thinking. In in fact, at 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 ETS, there's a whole section led there um, in, in 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 which you study that. That's perhaps that perhaps is your future uh, webinar. We could work on that. <laughs> okay, good. And I see we have. Thank you so much for that, Prof. And we see Pradeep, right? How do we, we spoke a lot about culture, yes. How do we change culture? How do we change this culture? Is it that we provide marks to make, it, to make it mandatory through policy to ensure that these positive areas of assessment be included? So you know what I'm thinking, Dr. Hill, and just brainstorming, 
I think we need to have a part two of this conversation. Yeah, this well, I'm, I'm thinking that perhaps we can take the conversations to the Yama group and that we would yes. encourage the colleagues. Yes. Let's let's kind of de demystify that we need to spend three hours yes, in Zoom because we want to be we want to be flexible with you as well, knowing that you're very busy. So you can join. Go ahead and join that Yama community. We are exploring mm -hmm. many things. And by the way, we do have our UE faculty cafe on the 19th. Yes. Please join. Please join. You're in for a great treat if you join. Trust me. Join for a great All treat. Right. So those of you on on St. Augustine campus do join us for the yes. UE faculty cafe. I was just about to say, so so the week's events, it's online, but the, the faculty cafe is a face-to-face -face event. So yes, it is. If you happen to be on campus or even to, to our representatives from Jamaica, Mona, um, Kayfield campuses, um, you might probably want to get a plane ticket that you know, you might <laughs> be there in Trinidad around that time and you can join us by all means. And we all provide right? we provide a light lunch. So <laughs> yes, we provide a light lunch. All right. So we have the different avenues for that you can um, engage um, we engage us. Our Yama community, we also have our YouTube channel. So if you need to take a look at this work, this uh, event, as well as other events, you know, and learning outcomes and designing course proposals, creating instructional media, et cetera, and even Dr. Hill's session on, on assessments and so on, we also have them there. Um, so thank you for attending. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for participating. And um, thank you to our panelists who have really um, enlightened us and provided us with um, uh, valuable insight to the landscape of assessments in higher education. All right, have a good afternoon, everyone.